Altery Insurance, the insurance people. And don't you want insurance people so that you don't have to be insurance people? Uh, I, I don't really necessarily want to do the dirty work. I want to know somebody else is working for me. And that's what you get with Altery Insurance, a custom tailored insure experience, insurance experience for you, designed just for you. You don't get just put into a barrel like everybody else on your street. Uh, it's designed for exactly your needs, no matter what kind of insurance you're looking for, small business, home life, whatever it is. Go check that out at Alteri.ca because Alteri is changing the conversation. Joining us now, as he does each and every Wednesday, our NHL insider from the Ray and Dregs Hockey Podcast, and of course, TSN as well, it's Mr. Darren Dreger with Sakaris and Price. How are you doing, Dregs? I'm doing well, guys. How are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Uh, must say, a little surprised that not a lot of activity here on the NHL trade front, particularly here, because, you know, not only do we have the new regime, but we have the new regime when the guy with the big reputation for moving early yeah. on the trade deadline. Yeah. And we're running out of days, I think, to run to move early if we haven't already run out of those days. So why so quiet here? Why no hurry from Jim? Rutherford? Yeah, I only because I think it's it's a different position for Jimmy Rutherford. Uh, and by extension, Patrick Galvin and the Vancouver Canucks. Um, you know, Jimmy, historically, as trader Jim, has always identified his needs early, but normally that's based on plug and holes. You know, finding, you know, a piece that is, is maybe going to bolster a position, whatnot, as they get deeper into the second half of the season and, and then ready for the playoffs. You know, it's it's not like... Rutherford and Alvin management ownership of the Vancouver Canucks don't want to qualify for the playoffs. Of course they do. I mean, that's ultimately why you, you play the games that you play. That's why the players certainly play is for an opportunity. Um, but the needs of the Vancouver Canucks go deeper than that. And so I think that everybody there deeply wants to keep it competitive. There's a high level of belief that they can qualify for the playoffs. So Rutherford and Alvin are less in buyer mode and more in patient seller mode. And I think that's obviously where they're at. I mean, if you look at the unrestricted free agents, you know, there's been a bit of buzz around Tyler Mott, um, you know, over the course of the last couple of days, I would say. And I think it's justified. I'm sure that teams are calling. In fact, I know teams are calling. But I also know how highly the Canucks have, have talked about Tyler, historically speaking. So that doesn't mean he's not being traded. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. Uh, but is he the, the flavor of the week because we've grown weary of speculating on JT Miller, Brock Besser, Connor Garland, and others? Um, I, I just think that, that Rutherford, like uh, maybe Kent Hughes, Jeff Gordon in Montreal, are waiting for the buyers to legitimately establish what the market is. They put out their prices so the buyers know what the expected return is, um, but the sellers haven't had to adjust yet. And they're going to have to, or somebody is going to panic. And that's what you're waiting for in being a patient seller, is waiting for a team to, in the next umpteen days to March 21st, struggle a little bit, maybe unfortunately have an injury that prompts the general manager or ownership to encourage the general manager to go out and, and make a move and not let this season unravel. So there's still time. The latest sort of connection people are making, because uh, again, we're, we're playing the AGM spotted here in their game. It was Derek Clancy yeah. in, in Pittsburgh, which would be, I don't know. You tell me, would it be, would it be weird for, uh, you know, both Alvin and, and Rutherford to make a deal with the former club? Does that make sense in some regards? And is it also just weird given the needs or wants of the Pittsburgh Penguins? Would that necessarily jive with the Vancouver Canucks? Yeah, I wouldn't call it weird. You know, I think Pittsburgh is, is pretty aware that their window with their current group is, is closing. And when I look at the Pittsburgh Penguins organizationally, there's not a lot coming. And, and you know, not a ton different than the Vancouver Canucks. And those two teams, as we've talked about on the show before, are both strongly in the college free agent market as well. Well, when you're in that market, you're not just looking for a free player. You're <clears throat> looking to to bolster what you've got coming in way of prospects. Normally those players, you know, aren't jumping into the National Hockey League and just taking the league by storm. There's there's some seasoning that has to uh, to to take place here. 
Um, but Pittsburgh is is fought higher up the food chain. I mean, there's there's a chance for the Pittsburgh Penguins. They're still going to have to work for it. So I think that they're legitimately looking at some of the potential in the Vancouver Canucks. You know, what's going to become of Brock Besser? Could he be a fit in Pittsburgh? I mean, go down the list. We can throw any player out we want that we have speculated on related to the Vancouver Canucks. And I could probably build a case why the Pittsburgh Penguins would have some interest. So, you know, again, I mentioned Montreal earlier. I'm sure that the Penguins have done their due diligence scouting the Montreal Canadiens. Normally, the teams that are looking to add are paying real close attention to those teams that can trigger that selling market. And that is Vancouver, Montreal, and maybe to some degree, the Philadelphia Flyers, to name a few. Uh just staying on Pittsburgh for a second. Am I right that they just want to move Kasperi Kapitan, having a terrible year on 3.2 million restricted free agent with our brights? And then is there any chance they would move Marino, the right shot defenseman at 4.4 signed long-term? Uh, well, there's always a chance, Matt, you know, it's the old, just make me a hockey trade offer, right? The cliche that's, thrown out there and if we can get better then of course we'll consider it i have not heard marino's name out there i've have i have heard kasperi kapitan's name out there um but in fairness i i checked on that with two highly regarded um pittsburgh penguin sources and you know one said look you know we are not purposefully trying to to move kasperi kapitan but if the right deal is there and there's a player coming back that we think fits into our group, then yes, of course, we would consider that. And the other source I checked in with Pittsburgh, fairly high ranking, just said, no, nope, not interested <laughs> in a trade period. But I, I think that they have to, right? For all the reasons that we've already talked about, specific to the Penguins. You know, I thought Kapanen would be a good fit there. I really did. I, I thought that his skating, how dynamic he can be, his edge work, all of that was was going to work well with the group they have there, and it hasn't worked well this year. So I mm-hmm. could certainly see a change of scenery, but the Penguins are being very careful in how they sell that. Blake fell in love with him a few years ago when he was a Maple Leaf here and and played just at a tremendous game at the Rogers Canucks were so Arena. slow. That guy and looked like he was God. just lightning, right? Well, and, and yeah. look, he uh, could uh, fly. You know, yeah. in 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 Toronto, he was building that. You thought, okay, this is a first round pick who might be a nice. But even last year, he was 30 points in 40 yeah. games for Pittsburgh. That's fine. Yeah. But 26 points in 56, 57 games, nine goals. And yeah, that's disappointing. like you're marching towards that. Do we really want to qualify even this guy oh, yeah. uh, at those, at those totals? So uh, it's an interesting dilemma uh, for Pittsburgh. Uh, let me just ask this when we talk about uh, Rutherford not being in a hurry or anything. Darren, do you know definitively if they've made the internal decision not to trade JT Miller that we're keeping this guy unless we are absolutely blown out of the water with an offer. Uh, I mean, close to that, I would say, Matt. You know, whether and, and but I, I, I think the options that can be presented and what blows you out of the water can be multiple too, right? Uh, I mean, you can conjure up what sort of package might be needed to move JT Miller. Look, I can tell you, most of the managers who have expressed interest in JT Miller and those that are least intrigued are all collectively telling me the same thing. They believe that it's more likely if JT Miller is to be traded, he's going to be traded at the draft or in the off season. And that's just buying a little bit of time, right? And also keeping things as competitive as you can in Vancouver. There's no rush with him under contract. However, let's see how the pieces fall here in the days ahead. And, you know, if a, a team that maybe has, has eyes on hurdle out of San Jose doesn't get hurdle or he's not traded. Well, maybe the assets they were willing to spend there, they want to click over and take another run at JT Miller, as an example. Uh, same might apply to Claude Giroux, although he's kind of a special case, isn't he? Because of how he controls this process. And it's not like Claude Giroux is going to tell Pat Brisson and Chuck Fletcher, all right, just here, any one of these 10 teams and I'll be fine. No, that's not going to happen. What's going to happen is Giroux is going to make <clears throat> his uh, position known. Uh, I believe he's going to waive and he will be traded, but the list is going to be very, very short. So, when, you know, when the big pieces fall, and I think JT Miller deserves to be in those bigger pieces, maybe a team that is disappointed, they didn't get the guy that they were hoping for, then, you know, kind of somewhat panics and goes back to Alvin and Rutherford and says, hey, 
I know we kick tires, but here's what we're willing to do. And that scenario then becomes something that Vancouver has to move on more quickly. Let's uh, attack the Vancouver Canucks from a different angle in this, that, you know, is they make a push to the playoffs here and it's going to have to be an amazing push for them to make it. Is anybody, because they're not going to acquire, they're not going to get better. I mean, internally they might get better, but they're not going to acquire new talent to get better, one wouldn't think. What about the other teams around them? Is there any wiggle room for Edmonton to get better, to make sure they make the playoffs? Dallas, Nashville, or even Vegas, too, who are sort of flirting with disaster here these days. Any yeah. of those teams going to get better, do you think, in the next few, uh, in the next week and a half? It's going to be a challenge. You know, it really is. Um, you know, if we park in Edmonton for a moment, I mean, we keep talking about the same things over and over and over again, right? And that market has been screaming for uh, a goaltender. You know, I, I can't imagine a team is going to upgrade their goaltending because that normally doesn't happen in season, near the trade deadline or otherwise. It doesn't happen. I mean, you you have to figure that out in the offseason more than anything. Or, you know, you settle on what you think could at least give you a better level of goaltending. I, for the life of me, look, I said something on, on, on Ottawa Senators' pregame show 10 days, two weeks ago, about how I thought Anton Forsberg was was going to be a decent commodity for the Ottawa Senators. I got a note from someone within the organization that said, well, if you know anybody's willing to make an offer, send them our way. Like, I like I, I don't know who, like, why aren't these teams watching Anton Forsberg? <laughs> like, he's, he's been really good. He's been really good amid the adversity that the Sens have had to tangle with, with, you know, Murray's out, what, seventh time now on injury reserve in a year and a half in Ottawa. Uh, they don't really want to play the yo-yo game with Gustav Cities back in Belleville. So my point is, you know, I, I can't imagine it's going to take a whole lot to get him out of Ottawa. But beyond that, who are we talking about on that goalie market that could make Edmonton better? So if they're not going to do that, then the help has to come internally. And right now, to be fair, they've got a light of fire under Dreisaitl and Connor McDavid. They don't have pop in their game, which sounds crazy saying that out loud but that's true. Um, so can that be fixed via trade? Probably not. I think their acquisition was likely Evander Kane. And then the other teams, I mean, I'm not buying the Philip Forsberg on the block. I'm not. I'm not. Like, you make that trade, and Nashville ends up missing the playoffs, so you bow out early, you know, heads are going to roll at the end of the season. That's how important a piece he is. I understand they don't want to pay him $9 million, but nobody likes paying their top-end players the big bucks in the salary cap. Dallas, you know, we got to keep an eye on on John Klingberg. Uh, they really haven't made a decision yet as to what they're going to do with him. Uh, again, not different than Forsberg. It seems a stretch to me that Dallas, a, you know, a playoff contending team would move an important piece like that rather than use him as their own rental. They haven't had really, unless something's changed in the last day and a half, they haven't had any meaningful dialogue with the agent of John Klingberg. So there's some curious ones kind of twisting in the wind for sure. Matt, I'm just looking at, Oh, looking at the laundry list for drags. Yes. I'm looking at my list of <laughs> questions here and it is a, it is a laundry. Uh, it is a laundry list. Uh, here's one. I don't think we have discussed. Yeah, Bruce, Rob. Bruce Boudreaux is 28 and four as head coach to the Vancouver Canucks. And yeah. the reports are out there that because he just was so desperate to get back in coaching and bet on himself, that not all of next year's contract or any of next year's contract is guaranteed. Have you heard anything about making Bruce a little bit more permanent or extending Bruce here as head coach of the Canucks? Uh, I have not. Um, and that's curious to me, and, and that will require a little bit more digging and intelligence. Um, you know, I feel like even though, you know, Jimmy Rutherford wasn't employed by the Vancouver Canucks at the time, you know, he at least from a friendly consulting perspective likely would have been asked uh, about Brudero prior to the Aquilinis making that hire. He wouldn't have had any influence or input into the firing of Travis or Jim Benning. Simply put, you know, we're going to make this decision 
here's the guy that we're thinking about. What do you think? And frankly, I, I'm not so sure that's not where the whole relationship between Francesco and uh, Jim Rutherford, you know, kind of went to another level. So it would feel strange to me if Boudreaux was fighting for his, his career here. Um, but I, I honestly don't have a, a definitive response to that other than a, a, a bit of surprise. And yeah. I guess I'd be more surprised if they cut him loose. No, I'd be more I, surprised just given everything that has gone into bringing him in and, and the success that they've had with him. Yeah, I, I, I don't think, boy, the way he's uh, taken over this market and, and this team, I, I don't think there's any chance no. that they're going to cut him loose. It's just when he got hired, I think you're absolutely right, Dregs, that you know uh, Rutherford was... Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Rutherford was uh, advised on the coaching hiring, sort of gave his blessing. Yeah. Boudreau became the coach here. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, we saw this report, and I forget where it originally stemmed well, from, Blake, that, you know, maybe, you know, he wasn't guaranteed for next year, that the Canucks were risking, you know, nothing beyond this season. And then I saw LeBron sort of double down on that recently, yeah, saying, yeah. yeah, it's a very odd contract for Boudreau with no guarantees or not a lot of guarantees for next no. season. And so I just wonder, you know, you're a coach with a 28 and four record uh, and uh, marching towards the final third of the season that, you know, maybe you would want a little bit well, more certainty uh, and then maybe the Canucks would want to reward yeah. him, but I'm sure he wants that. But, but now that we talk this through, you know, I'm reminded of Boudreaux coming on the podcast and, and <clears throat> talking about how hungry he was to get back coaching. And in fact, he was, you know, contemplating getting into the American League and, and coaching just because he loves it so much. So when you're at that place um, and without Rutherford being employed when he was hired, I mean, look, it's happened before. I remember Paul Maurice uh, taking over in Carolina when Jim Rutherford was the general manager there, right? And he went in relatively late, if not you know, mid-season, somewhere around there. He did that really as a professional favor to Jim Rutherford because Jimmy had been so good to him and there were no guarantees that it was going to be extended. And then it, it was extended. So, you know, given the, the predicament of, of the Aquilini's and the Vancouver Canucks at the time and how hungry Bruce was to get back into coaching. Now that we talk this through, maybe, maybe we shouldn't be surprised that it's that short, but that that'll get looked after at the end of the year. Yeah. I, I was going to say that's yeah. a post deadline. Uh, I suspect. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Th this team matter. doesn't want to become the Oilers and have, you know, 82 coaches over seven seasons. Well, that's oh, it. Yeah. That's no. it. Right. Um, anyways. Uh, all right. Are we done here? Uh, oh, other than the, uh, the, like the college free agents should be coming any day now. Right. Correct. Yeah. And there's a, there's a good number of them. There really are. Uh, it's always difficult to pinpoint uh, which NHL teams are the, the hottest on which player, right? Because, you know, you're, you're dealing with player agents, but they're not. They're family advisors. And they're incredibly careful, as they have to be, to, you know, not cross lines and, and, and all of those things. Um, I know the Vancouver Canucks have been pretty active. I touched on that earlier in the segment. Um, you know, I'm not suggesting that they're going to land this kid or that he is their primary target, but I think you guys recall me mentioning Corey Andonofsky from Princeton. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I know that Pittsburgh, when Patrick Galvin was the AGM in Pittsburgh, um, was already doing due diligence on this kid. Um, and there have been other teams that have, have shown the same level of interest, but I, I think Vancouver would be very much in and that he's mix. A, he's itself. a forward, but, he's a forward, right? Not a defenseman. Yeah, he's a forward. Yeah. 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 BC Junior League forward too, by the way. Yeah. So yeah, Chilliwack. He's he's yeah. got some ties there. But uh this is always a tough decision for those young guys. You know, the season is gonna end just in a disappointing fashion for him in the NCAA level. That's fine. He's excited about picking his NHL stop. But man, you know, these teams put the hard press and they promise, okay, well, here's why we are the best fit for you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's not easy. So they take their time in uh, making those decisions. But I, I would expect Andonovsky, um, and there's probably eight, ten others, you know, depending on when their season ends. But in his case, it's basically over here. So he'll probably make mm -hmm. his decision within the week. Yeah, there's a, a number of uh, these college free agents with BC ties. You mentioned Andonovsky, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jake yeah. Livingstone, uh, Creston, BC, and a former Langley Riverman at Minnesota State, a big red shot 
defenseman. So yep. we'll keep our eyes yep. and ears peeled. Thank you for this, Dregs. Much obliged, and we'll catch up next Wednesday. All right, guys. Have a great week. Darren Dreger, our NHL insider. Folks, Stuart Zuckerman and the Zuckerman Law Group. Want to make sure that one of the stressful moments of your life uh, just has a little less stress, a little more certainty, and certainly guidance. And that's what you get with Zuckerman Law Group. Over 100 years of combined courtroom experience. Nothing shocks them. They've seen and heard pretty much everything, which is important because, uh, hey, lots of things going down during a separation or divorce, both financially and personally. Uh, you want to make sure that there's a rudder there. Get that rudder for your ship, for your vessel with Stuart Zuckerman and the Zuckerman Law Group. The best thing to uh, do is give them a call, get a no obligation, completely confidential consultation and find out about their process. 